Well, I'm here to preach till 2 o'clock today, just because of... <laughs> Take that, Amy. You know, um, I'm not going to preach till 2 o'clock. 1.45, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. We're systematically going through, uh, going through Romans. And... Um, and honestly, Roman, the first part of Romans is, and, and I know all of us that have been sharing uh, in, on, on Sunday mornings, uh, you know what, it's, it's, uh, it's been a little challenging. Romans is a challenging book. And uh, uh, we, we, the first eight chapters of Romans is, you know, it's kind of, I don't want to say, I mean, okay, so, so the, the first, it's broke down, I'm going to break it down. One to three, Paul proclaims the gospel, how we were created uh, by, by the Almighty God, yet broke his law, our human nature is inherently sinful, we naturally turn against God, we are hopeless in our own efforts to be made right with a holy God. And then we move into Romans chapter five to six, Paul shows how God provided a way out of our hopelessness and into righteousness through the perfect life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Right. Yes, we all should get excited about that, right? And then Romans 6 to 8 speaks of the power of the Spirit who enables us to live differently than before Christ. How many of you know that it's the power of the Spirit that gives us the ability to live differently? Amen? It's not, and, and it's not, uh, it's not our behavior that, uh, uh, how did I put it? I'm trying to remember, I'm gonna mess this up, but the whole dynamic of uh, how, how uh, a relationship with Christ and how coming to, coming to Christ should change the way we live. Would you all agree with that? There should be a difference, right? There should be a difference in how we live. And uh, so now, um, it says, you know, in, in, Romans, in Romans, I think it is the eighth chapter, uh, it boasts of some incredible promises. Like, for instance, on, uh, you've got control of this, right, Dave? All right, good deal. For instance, this passage, Romans 3, 38 to 39, for, say it with me. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a phenomenal promise of God, isn't it? What a phenomenal promise of God. There's nothing that can separate us from his love. Now, so we walk away from chapter 8 thinking, wow, that was, uh, what, a, what a great God we have. I, I don't deserve to be in his care, uh, but he loves me and nothing can change that. Then we come to chapter 9. So, all those, were, all, all those are, are some, we, it's some, I don't want to say easy, but it's easier for us to follow through on some of that stuff. But now in chapter 9, you see, and let me back up just a second. You have to understand why Paul wrote this letter. Okay, Paul wrote this letter because, number one, all of a sudden, there's Gentiles coming into this thing that was supposed to be Jewish. All right? So you got these Gentiles coming into this, uh, to this whole scene, this whole Jesus scene, if you will. And now what do we do with the Gentiles? The Jewish guys are saying, well, you know, we Jews, we're circumcised. The Gentile said, oh, I don't know about that. And so there's this whole give and take, this whole thing that's trying to sort through, are, is there supposed to be two separate churches? Is there supposed to be a, a Gentile church? Is there supposed to be a Jewish church? What's supposed to happen here? How does this all work? And so Paul is addressing this stuff. He's addressing this whole dynamic of how we live together and the dynamic of the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and what does this all mean? So in chapter, chapter it, previous to chapter 9, we talk about the whole dynamic of, of how the Gentiles can come in and, and are, 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 are able to 
to embrace the salvation that God offers through Jesus Christ. But now in chapter 9, Paul starts off with talking about the dynamic of the Jews that have rejected Jesus. How many of you know there are Jews that have rejected Jesus? All right. So he's talking about the Jews that have rejected Jesus. And, and I want to, let's see, uh, let me, before I get in too far, how many know, would, how many understand that God is sovereign? <laughs> now, I, I say this because we have to be able to understand the sovereignty of God. Because we're talking today about, you're going to hear terms like election, like predestination. You're going to hear those kinds of terms today. But we have to start with a foundation that says God is sovereign. Can we do that? God is sovereign. I don't know about you, but I don't believe that I can make decisions like God can. I don't know about you, but I at times have trouble making just simple decisions in my life, let alone big decisions in my life. So, what do I mean by God is sovereign? Well, he is the supreme ruler of everything. Now, if you don't believe that, well, then we've got other things to talk about. If you don't believe that God is the supreme ruler of all and rules this whole world, then we've got something else to talk about. My, I didn't think my preaching was that bad. <laughs> you know, John said, John's got, where's John go? Did he leave our, leave our, John said something about leaving, had to, had to leave a little early today. And I said, well, you might not be the only one that leaves early. See, there we go. <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> Boy, she's an unhappy camper. Steve, what'd you do to her? <laughs> wow. All right, let's all take a deep breath. There we go. But to fully, but to fully comprehend this chapter, we've got to remember that God is God. Are we okay with that? Are we really okay with that? Okay, so we just sang this song. If more of you means less of me, take everything. It's kind of like we're just skipping and singing the song, taking it really. But the fact of the matter is, are you good with that? Are you good with that? Are you good with the fact that God is sovereign over everything? Are you good with the fact that we have the creator that created the heavens and the earth, that created each one of us, that created everything on this earth? Are you okay with, be, with God being God? Because we, there you go, good. Because that's where we have to start when we start with talking about things like election. So, he works out his plans. He wants to work out his plans for our lives. He wants to work his plan for the world. We used to sing a song in the 90s. Maybe, I don't know if anybody here knows it, but it, it, it goes like this. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give. By your plan, that's just the way it is. That's the way that verse ends. That's just the way it is. I've been on many, many, many death scenes and things like that through the sheriff's office. And people ask, 
They always ask the question, what's the first question everybody asks? Why? And you know what? I don't try to answer that question because I don't know why, but I do know God is God. I do know God is God. So if we can establish that to start with today, I think it's important because it, 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 chapter 9 underscores the fact that God is God. And that's just the way it is. Since God is God, we know that all his choices are completely right, including his choice as Israel as a special people. You see, God's original design for Israel was that he, they would just make his glory known. That was his desire, initial desire, is that he would make, they would make his glory, God's glory known. You know, the interesting part of it is, is that they were to be, first of all, they, they were to be to the, the radiance, so to speak. I mean, they were supposed to declare God that, as God, the King of kings and the, and the Lord of lords. Abraham. Was Abraham a Jew? Whoa, nobody wants to jump on that. Abraham was the first Jew. Right? Abraham was chosen by God. Why did God choose Abraham? You know, Abraham was not a real, he was an idol worshiper and everything else before God got a hold of him. Why did God choose Abraham? I don't know. Why did God choose you? Now, don't look at somebody else and say, I don't know why God chose you. No, no, why? Why? Abraham was Jewish. The kings were Jewish. The prophets were Jewish. The Old Testament is written in the Jewish language, which is what? Hebrew. I mean, this was a a Jewish thing. The Jews, the children of Israel were God's people and God chose them. And he did all this to bring Jesus Christ through the nation of Israel. And, and you know what? The sad part of it is, and what Paul's talking about here is that all this was about, all this was God's promises. And he, and he goes through all these promises in, 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 in Romans here. In, in Romans chapter 9, he says, uh, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. I think I got that up there, don't I? Uh, uh, don't I, Dave? I'm not sure. Yeah. But anyway... I want to read this whole thing here. It says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brother and my countrymen according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. Who pertain the adoption. Now I got a different version, right? There we go. I mean, look at this. He made covenants with them. He gave them his law. He revealed his glory to them. He gave them the privilege of worshiping, uh, worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. This was something God gave them. And Paul said, you know what? It grieves me because guess what? Jesus comes on the scene and many of the Jews don't care. And they don't receive him. And Paul goes to the point, he goes to the extreme of saying, you know what? I would give up my salvation for all those that are rejecting Jesus. Paul was heartbroken here for those that didn't know Jesus. He was heartbroken. Which begs the question, are we as heartbroken for people that we know that don't know Jesus? Now, I want you to think about a person that you know doesn't know Jesus. 
Think about them right now. Bring them to the front of your mind. Are you heartbroken over that person that doesn't know Jesus? Because that's what Paul was. It was his people. And he was heartbroken over the fact that they didn't accept, believe Jesus. Here they were, the ones that got the promises, the ones that all, that God gave all this thing, that God took them here and took them there and let them out of here and there. And all of a sudden, the very, very God comes in the flesh and they reject him. We could go on and talk about how we reject God in the same kinds of ways. Here's a group of people who experienced so many blessings of God. And they were specifically chosen, protected, given the law, brought into covenant with God, and given promises of peace and prosperity. Yet they obviously didn't appreciate it and instead Many rejected Jesus over and over and over again and still do. By the way, I just want to, just a side note here. Why do we, why do we support Israel? I want to be careful here. I'm not trying to get political here on you. It's not because Israel is this perfect people. In fact, they've had their share of bad stuff. But it's because of God's promises. Amen? It's because of God's promises. Just a side note, I'm not going to jump into that too far, too deeply. But notice particularly Paul's attitude towards the ones that are rejecting Christ. It says, he was filled with sorrow and unending grief. He was heartbroken. And the grief was so extreme that he was willing to give up his own salvation if his people, the Jews, would accept Christ. It shows the intensity of his love for his people. Do you have a burden for your family member? Do you have a burden for your coworker, for your fellow student, for your friend? What about those running for political office? Do you have a burden for them? But they know Jesus. Well, Paul sets the stage with that, that heart. By, he, he builds that framework of heart posture right there to start with. Now, chapter 9 is a deep passage. It's a deep chapter. In fact, in fact, chapter 9 is probably one of those chapters that should be broken down to at least three, uh, three or four messages. But I, so I'm not going to get very far with it today. But I, I just want you to know, Paul didn't write this for some elite theologians to sit there and debate over. Paul wrote this for Christ's followers to grow a concern for those that don't embrace Christ. Chapter isn't some sort of debate of who God loves and who he rejects. Some call it predestination, some call it election. What does election mean? Let's, let's, let's tackle that one to start with. It means God's sovereign choice of people by no merit of their own. God, I'm not talking about the political election. I'm not talking about when you put your vote down, so to speak. But it's God's sovereign choice of people by no merit of their own. Abraham, like I said, what was, what was, what was so great about Abraham? We don't know. We, we, we don't know why God chose Abraham, but he chose Abraham. What's that? He said, yes, there you go. He did. Yeah. And I'll get to that. Don't jump ahead of me, Nathaniel. (laughs) Again, we can't deny God's election, if you will, or choosing of the Jews because it's all over Scripture. God called a people for himself, starting with Abraham and his descendants, to be a special people, to be his special people. So you all have, we, you have all this elect and chosen talk, which begs the question, who exactly does God call? What needs to happen in somebody's life for them to be called? But Paul, he, he kind of seems to know, Paul throughout the Romans, he, he kind of jumps questions. You know, you know, he, knows, he knows they're coming. 
And so he kind of jumps ahead and, and, and answers them before they even get there. But Paul, see, he, he knows what the readers are thinking. Did God already decide who will be saved? Did God already decide who will be saved? Doesn't God desire everyone to be saved? Well, I mean, what about these verses? First one, first, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Go on. Next one. Ezekiel 18, 23. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? And the last one, I'm going to just share three of them. 2 Timothy 2, 4. God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Can we hold on to that? Can we hold on to the fact that God wants everyone to come to know him? Can we hold on to that? God knows and decides all. He knows all, but simply he is God. However, also, how many of you know that he gives us the choice to whether or not receive that or not? He grants mercy, his mercy to all if they accept it, and also has special purpose for those that choose him. Now, So when we talk about God's choosing, and I'm going to uh, hold on to this till I get to the end here because you're gonna, we're going to try to put it back together. But Paul gives, an example, gives some examples through Israel's history. But let me start back further than that, a start of Israel. God chose Abraham, a pagan idol-worshiping man, as the start of the nation of Israel. And Abraham accepted the call. Right, Nathaniel? He accepted the call. God chose Abraham's son by Sarah, Isaac, and not Ishmael, the older son. Isaac had a twin had the Isaac had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And again, God chose the younger one, Jacob. Esau was not chosen as the one that would carry God's plan. Are we still okay with God being God? Doesn't seem fair, does it? I mean, after all, it, it, he also chose Pharaoh to be a servant to eventually release the Israelites from slavery. Are we okay with God being God? You see, we as Americans have, this, have trouble with this picking and choosing thing. Let's face it. How many, how many of you just wish God would just decide the next election? that be so much better? Wouldn't it be so much better if God just says, this is who, who it is. This is my plan. Do you know that there's only one vote in heaven? There's only one vote in heaven. You see, we have trouble with this as Americans, as those who want my say. I want my say. I want my vote. How's that going for you? How's you wanting your, your say going for you? Go ahead and try that when you get to heaven. See how that works out for you. The point being, I don't know about you, but God is the best one to make big decisions. How does that sound?
He alone decides, and our job is to fully trust his decision. And our job is to simply accept his decisions and know that his decisions are perfect and are best for you. You know why? Because he has a predestined plan for you. All right. Well, let's break that down a little bit. He has a predestined plan for you. So if we break that into the pre and the destiny part, we've got the, how many here know that God has a destiny for your life? Oh, come on. I guess I better back up and start preaching something else here about destiny. I want you to know that God has a destiny for you, a plan and a purpose, a destiny that was established before you could even think about it. God had a plan, and God had a destiny. Your life was predestined. Now, granted, it was your choice of whether or not you would follow that destiny or not. God's not a puppeteer that sits up in heaven pulling strings. But he has a plan. I hear so often, I, I, I hear, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my, my plan is. And I don't know. I want to, what, 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 what. You know what? I want you to know here today that God has a destiny for you. That God has a plan for your life. That God has purpose in your life. And that purpose he established way before you could ever think about it. The frustration is <laughs> nobody has a plan these days, do they? I, 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 I heard uh, somebody talk about the... Uh, uh, I, I didn't watch the debates, but somebody saw, talked about the debates, how nobody gave us a plan. You see, right now, what's happening is there's everybody complaining about what's not getting done and nobody proposing a plan of how to get it done. But see, the key is for us as believers is that the plan has already been established by God. Our destiny. God has our destiny in his heart. And where we thought, that, where we're in a confused world, how many would say our world is confused? I would say that. In a world that is totally confused and not knowing anything, not knowing where they're going, what the plan is, and so on, God says, I've got a plan for your life. And I've got a destiny for you. Well, Paul goes on to talk about it. I'm going to read a little bit more here. He says... Picking up with verse six, but it's not the word of God has. But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. Now remember that. Note that they are not all Israel who is Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is. Those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counting as the seed. In other words, what Paul's saying, I want you to know that you don't get in because of who your parents were. You don't get in because of who your bloodline is. You don't get in because you're Jewish. That's Paul's putting it there. Because the people, the children of the promise aren't those that are, that are just a bloodline. The children of the promise are those that receive the gift of salvation.
Paul says at this point, he points out that it doesn't matter whether or not you were born an Israelite or have all this Jewish history in your pocket. That's not what makes us one of God's chosen. In other words, God's people are not just ones with Jewish blood. Verse 6 says, not all the people of Israel are the true people of Israel. What matters is who will embrace God's promise through Israel, the promise of a Savior, namely Jesus Christ. Who is going to be the, the, the children of the promise? Those that receive the promise of Jesus Christ. And Paul is making it very clear. And he's dealing with those that say, ah, oh, you know what? I'm Jewish. I got it in, man. I'm good to go. I'm good with God. No, you're not. Because you've got to be good with Jesus. Paul's addressing those that thought that just because they were born into a Jewish family, that meant they were good to go. Paul is saying it's not your family ties. It's not your, 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 the, you're not a part of, a, of the people of God because of the family you're physically born into. That's true for all of us here this morning. I want you to know, I don't care what your upbringing is. I don't care if you got, grew up in a Christian. I mean, I, I care. Don't hear me. Hear, hear what I'm saying here. There are some here that have grown up in Christian homes, and that's great. There are some here, though, that have grown, that have grown up in wicked homes. And I want you to know, either way, you can be God's chosen. Either way, there's a destiny on your life. Either way. In addition, it's not based on uh, who we are, but, but it's also not based on what we've done. Look at verse 11 here. It says, uh, I'm going to start just going to... Uh, verse 9 here, for this is the word of promise that time I shall come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, uh, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who stands. He says, in other words, Paul is saying, I don't care what you've done, whether you've done good stuff or bad stuff. I don't know how many times I've heard those that, that uh, are, have, are, are, are coming to Christ, they're, they're wanting to come to Christ, and they say, but I, I've done so many bad things. I've done so many bad things. Paul is telling them, I don't care what you've done, whether it's good or bad, that doesn't get you in, but all are able to receive the gift of salvation. There are some here this morning that you can think back on your life. And you can think back on how bad, if I could put it this way, how bad your upbringing was, how hard it was, how wicked it was. Maybe there was abuse. Maybe there was other things going on. Maybe it's something that you've done. Maybe you've been doing some wicked things and so on and so forth. I want you to know that there's, there's nothing that you could have done that can't be placed at the feet of Jesus. It says whether good or bad. And I want you to know that even if, I, I don't know how many times I've heard, oh, this was a good person. Uh, somebody passes away, oh, they were, a good, they were a good person. I don't care how good they were. If they don't know Jesus, if they haven't come before Jesus and accepted the gift of salvation, they are not good with God. They are not good with God. No one can do, do anything to earn salvation. None of us have a right to salvation. <laughs> you know what? We, we are, we're in a day and age where everybody, I got rights. I got rights. You know what? How many of you know we really don't have any rights? We don't have a right to salvation. That's why it's called the gift of salvation. We tend to think we're entitled because we live in an age of entitlement. Did you all know that? Do you all know that we live in an age of entitlement? 
I deserve this. I deserve salvation. Can I encourage you? You know what you deserve? You deserve hell. You deserve eternal separation from God. And it's the gift of God through Jesus Christ that allows us to come back into relationship with God. God choose, still chooses some for special purposes as well. We saw it. Paul uses Jacob and Esau as an example. These twins were born just minutes apart, but Jacob was chosen to carry on the Jewish line rather than Esau. And it says, it, it, go, it says there, it says, um, it says, as it is written, Jason, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now that's a, that's a debated passage over and over again. Can I encourage you what that means? And, I, and this is going to be my interpretation of that. There might be other interpretations. But God's saying, Jacob, I've loved, and I've chosen him to carry on this plan that I have for all of the world. I haven't chosen Esau. In fact, that word hated there, some people try to wrap it nicely and so on. Basically, that word hated means rejected. In other words, I've rejected Esau to, car to carry that. Are we still okay with God being God? So in other words, it wasn't about Jacob or Esau. It was about God's plan and who was going to carry that. And God says, I'm going to carry that through Jacob and not Esau. And God can choose who he wants. He actually uses in this chapter 9, He actually uses the, I'm not going to go to it. He actually uses the story of the potter and the clay. Does the clay tell the potter? You don't like how the potter made him? No. No, he doesn't. It's interesting how God often chooses the unexpected ones to carry out his purpose. Heh. <laughs> It's 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 27 says this. It says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It's interesting how God chooses. One of the things I like about The Chosen, the, the, the TV series The Chosen. What I, one of the things I like about The Chosen is that these disciples are goofballs. Now, what do I mean by that? These disciples aren't the well-educated or everything else. They're, they're not the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the businessmen, successful businessmen and things like that. No, they're not. God used, he, Jesus called the disciples who were not, as the world would say, good enough. And you go back to the whole dynamic of, 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 of Jewish teaching their kids and you go for so long in, in a school and, and, and uh, uh, you learn the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Then you, if, if you're good enough at that point in time, you continue on. If you're not, you go back and you do a trade. You learn a trade from your, your, your parents, your dad, or whoever. You go back and you learn a trade. And then, but those that are good enough, they study Torah and they memorize the whole Torah and so on. And they get to the end. And then all of a sudden, if they're good enough, they study under the rabbi. And the rabbi says, once, they're, once they, they've completed all this, the rabbi says, if you're good enough, and he quizzes you, you ask all these questions and so on about what you believe, about the interpretation of the Torah and so on, and if you're good enough, he says, guess what he says? Come follow me. So now let's turn that into Jesus walking along the, the, the shore He's walking along the shore and he sees these goopballs, these fishermen out there fishing and so on and so forth. And, and he goes up to them and he says, guess what? I want you to follow me. 
They knew what that meant. They knew what that meant. In other words, Jesus was saying, you know what? You are good enough for me. I want you to know this morning that Jesus says, follow me. And let that mean something to you. So you see, what made those disciples special is that invitation. That invitation to come follow me. You see, we are a special people because we've received the invitation to follow Jesus. These disciples led a movement that would turn the world upside down. Guess what? God's plan, God's purpose, God's destiny for us is that we too help turn the world upside down. We've, we, as, we as Christ followers have been on the defensive for so long that we've lost an understanding of what the offensive is. We've been reeling and spinning because people saying we're this or we're that or this or that or the other thing. And so we haven't advanced the kingdom in that respect. We've allowed it to bring us to a halt and kind of get in protective mode. I believe even today, this very moment, that Jesus is, is calling us into a movement that will turn this world upside down. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart, that Jesus wants us to be a people, a follower that is going to turn the world upside down, just like his disciples did back in his, when he walked on this earth. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? So what can we learn from Romans 9? The first part of it anyway. First of all, the ones that embrace Jesus Christ are true children of God. In other words, those that have received salvation are accepted and those who have not are rejected. Does that mean it's unjust for God to allow people to go to hell? How would a good, loving God allow people to go to hell or send people to hell? No, no, no. You see, God offered. He offers to all. He offers to all of us. He's got a plan for all of us. He's got a destiny for all of us. And he offers it to us all. And it's up to us. To say yes. It's to say yes. And you know what happens? The fact of the matter is, is if we don't say yes, guess what that means? That means eternal separation from God. Is that unloving? Is it unloving that God sent his son to die for us so that we would have the opportunity? Is that unloving? Is it, it's, it's as if people are saying, oh, you're here. Nope, you're not going to, you're here. You're, no, 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 no. He offers it to us all. Remember those verses we talked about? He offers it to everyone. It's not his heart that anyone would miss him. But those that miss him will not be spending eternity with him. You see, we got to be careful how far down that road we go in regards to this whole thing about God sending people to hell and so on. Because it makes the, it makes the inference that God owes salvation to everyone. No, God offers salvation to everyone. He doesn't owe salvation to everyone. 
He offers it to everyone and only gives it to his elect. In other words, meaning those who accept his offer of Jesus. Is that unjust? Is that unfair? Absolutely not. I've come to realize there's there's some there's there's are multiple dimensions of God's love. First, God has a, a general love for all people. We know that, we see that. He has a general love for all people. But I but secondly, he has a special love for his for his chosen. Who have embraced and received Jesus' work on the cross. God's chosen people means God's gracious, sovereign calling in selecting and elect people for himself, that you know him, enjoy him, and experience his salvation. Again, it's not because of what you've come from. It's not because of the family genes. It's not because of what you've done, good or bad. It has nothing to do with that. And you know what? That should probably bring a pretty deep humility to us. To know that the foundation of our salvation isn't based on my commitment to God, but God's commitment to me. See, my salvation is not based My salvation is not based on my commitment to God. But my salvation is based on his commitment to me. Out of his commitment to me, I want to be committed to God. But we get that turned around. We think the world revolves around us. We think it's all about us when it's all about him. You know, I can't find a reason why God would call me. I remember when I first started pastoring, I was asked to pastor and I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the Bible that well. And I had a (laughs) great friend, pastor, who looked at me and said, then learn it. I don't know why God called me. I don't know. I don't have the greatest IQ. I'm not the greatest speaker. I'm not the, you know what? I didn't come from any special family. Contrary, when you talk to people about Berkey's, oh, yeah, you must be, yeah, I know, it's probably from Chick-fil-A is what I'm thinking. <laughs> but I didn't, come, I didn't come from a particular family, I, a, a special family. I didn't, we didn't have a lot of money. I wasn't, I wasn't good looking. <sighs> come on. No, that's all right. I want <laughs> I wasn't a successful businessman, athlete, or movie star. I wasn't all those things that the world says are important. And you know what? I didn't deserve him either. I didn't deserve him. I don't deserve to be one of God's elect in that regard. I don't deserve it. But out of his commitment to me, he calls me and he has a destiny for me. Yet God chose me. He came after me just like he comes after everyone else he created. I'm going to just close and wind this down and close with this, this, uh, with, with just talking about this just a little bit. Listen to the words of Malcolm Muggeridge, a brilliant Christian thinker speaking to God. He said, however far and fast I've run, still over my shoulder, I'd catch a glimpse of you on the horizon. 
And then I would run faster and farther than ever, thinking triumphantly, now I have escaped. But no, there you were coming after me. There was no escape, he said. I have never wanted a God or feared a God or felt under the necessity to invent one. Unfortunately, I am driven to the conclusion that God wants me. I want you to know this morning that God wants you. God wants you. He's predestined. He's got a destiny for you. He wants you. You stand with me. Hey, Marty, if you don't mind just playing a little bit, that'd be great. Because I want to just cheer a little bit. You know, when I, when I think of when I was pouring over this, this chapter and stuff, and I, I, uh, I, th- I saw how, you know, Paul talking about how the Jews rejected and so on. And, and I think about, I thought, you know, at first I thought, gee, what is wrong with them Jews? But then I think about my life. And I come to the point of saying, what is wrong with me? How can I do that? I want you to think about the destiny that God has for you. I want you to think about the plan, the purpose that God has for you. Because God has predestined the people I, I know that there are those in a crowd like this that would would are, are, are struggling with particularly the idea that God has a purpose and a plan in their life. I'm here to say that that God who is God, who is the creator of everything, the God that we've established God can sit, can do what God wants to do. I want you to know that he's offered this whole thing of salvation and destiny to you. He's chosen to offer it to you. The question is, will you receive that? The question is, will you embrace that? The question is, will you say yes, like Abraham said yes? Will you be, will you say yes and and willing, as we sang a little while ago, if more of you means less of me, then give him everything. The fact of the matter is, giving him it all, as he offers this to you, he offers the gift which none of us deserve. But he chooses to offer it to us. And give us a destiny in him. Father, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you, Lord God, that you are God and you're God alone. And that, Father, I I don't need to debate your decisions. I don't need to 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 uh, 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 decide whether those are good decisions or not. You chose the children of Israel. You chose Abraham, and you chose to bring Jesus through that line. I am so thankful for that, Lord God, and I am so thankful that you've offered it to me, an undeserving one. That you said, here, here's my gift. Receive it.
I do feel like there is, um, this is the kind of uh, message that requires response from us. So um, we're going to sing that, that song there, Marty. And I, I want you to understand that there is, like, like my dad said today, there's no question about the commitment that God has to us. There's no, there's no question about that. But now the question becomes, what's our commitment back? Right? What's our choice back? What's our decision? It's out there. The offer is there. The offer is there. But what's our decision in response to that? And so I want you to think about that as we're singing this song. What does that mean for me? Do I need to be, do I need to, to have a conversation with God that says, God, you've given me this gift and I choose to grab it. I choose to grab it. And if you don't know exactly what that means or what that looks like, we have people that want to pray right now with you. Okay? There's, there's people that are ready to pray for, you, pray for you today. Okay? So as we sing this song, if you, if you do feel like, hey, there's something I need to get right with God today. There's something I need to make of, as a decision today. I, whether that's accepting that free gift or if that's wondering what that means in more detail. There's people that we, hey, we want, just like God wants you, everybody to know who he is, like, we want you to understand this. So if this is like, ch you know, churning something in your heart, but you're not sure what that means, come and talk to somebody. Come and get some prayer about this because this is real. This is real. This is the core of salvation. This is the core of knowing who God is, is accepting Jesus, right? That's the core of, and the fu fundamental uh, foundation of who we are, okay? So I'm gonna ask, there's gonna be a couple of um, people from leadership team up here. I'm gonna ask some uh, others to be prepared to come pray, but come on, like let's, let's make a decision here, right? Let's make that decision to say, Jesus, I want to be more like you because I want, I want to know God. I want to accept that free gift of Jesus in my life so that I can be with God forever and understand what it means to be his chosen people, right? Who he predestined. So God, I pray that as we, as we worship through this next song, God, I pray, God, there, there would just be a movement of your spirit in people's lives. God, that there would just be a new revelation and a new understanding about who you are, God, and what you're calling us to. The fact that you de predestined us to, to know you, God. And I, I pray, God, that we would not pass up this opportunity, that we would not pr pass and, and ignore your call on our lives, God, because we know that you have offered something to us that nothing else can or no one else can. So today, God, we, we stand and say, yes, God, we choose your gift. We choose that today. So, Father, I pray you continue to move here, Father. Continue to press people's hearts to want to know who you are in this, in this gift, Father, we pray. came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross.